So is everybody in now? Oh, here they come. Hey, Ed. Hey, Ruben. Uh, we got we we got you up first, so uh, we'll go ahead. I'll I'll kind of introduce it and uh, uh, talk a little bit about the process really briefly, and then uh, we'll we'll launch into the DPR uh, issues. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, and if you have slides that you want to share separate from the PowerPoint that I sent, uh, let me know. And we'll we'll switch out. Share who who's sharing? Okay. I got, I got nothing, Ed. I got nothing. All right, so you can use mine. <laughs> All right, well, thanks, thanks everybody. Um, we are recording the session today. Uh, the session is to assist people in helping them to prepare for the uh, oral exam uh, process, which is going to take place in just a couple of weeks uh, and into, into June. Um, so I, we kind of wanted to just give everybody, uh, you know, this is going to be a little, a little bit like drinking out of a fire hose. Uh, we're going to give you a lot of information um, and introduce a lot of inf a lot of, a lot of things for you, topics that are potential that could be on the oral exam. Uh, it has been a while since any of us has actually uh, been uh, in that process, but uh, we'll we'll try to do the best we can to help you get prepared for it. So. Um, the presenters today are going to be Ruben Arroyo, the Riverside County Agricultural Commissioner. He's going to be discussing uh, pesticide issues. Uh, Angela Godwin is uh, the San Bernardino County Agricultural Commissioner and sealer, and she's going to be discussing weights and measures issues with us. Uh, Jose Arriaga is the Orange County Agricultural Commissioner and sealer, and he's going to be covering uh, Department of Food and Agriculture uh, plant health um, and uh, CACASA uh, issues. And then I'm gonna go ahead and wrap things up with some general information about, uh, I'm, I'm Ed Williams, by the way, I'm from Ventura County, the Ag Commissioner uh, Sealer here. And uh, we'll be talking about um, uh, how laws and regulations differ um, and how they're implemented. We'll talk about gas tax and some of those kind of things. So it uh, looks like we have a hand up with Takla uh, Mancarias with LA County. Um, maybe if you put your questions in the chat for now, uh, we'll try to monitor those and uh, go through uh, as, as we go. Um, Uh, a good question, Takla. The question is, will we be able to get the recording? And the answer is yes. Um, Josh Hunsinger uh, is our personnel uh, standards committee chair, and he's going to post them uh, on the CACASA uh, website uh, for a resource in the, into the future. So, so let's go ahead and get started. So basically, really quickly, the, the exam itself, you're gonna to go to the um, location where they identify that you're supposed to be uh, taking the exam. Uh, you'll check in. When it's your turn, uh, they will give you a packet of the questions in advance to give you a chance to review them ahead of time. You're welcome to take notes on those, on those sheets that they give you. Uh, they're going to give you about a half an hour uh, to, to review and, and prepare your thoughts on those questions. One thing you need to do is don't, don't go into detail on those, on those note sheets. It's, those are for you to, to, to kind of get you started. Um, and if you waste all of your time uh, writing down all, everything you know about one of those questions, you're going to lose out on being able to prepare for the other one. So you need to kind of budget your time when you're in there in that review process. Um, once, once your half an hour review process is up, they'll go ahead and the proctor will collect the, the, your notes. And when the panel members are ready to go ahead and interview you, uh, it may be five or 10 minutes, uh, 
between interviews when they they may be discussing a different a different candidate um, you know before you you're able to go in there so once you go in and you're introduced to the panel that is going to interview you they'll give you your notes back for you to refer to so if you kind of draw an outline of what your response is on those questions that that will really help you um, they will not allow any handbags, any cell phones, any calculators, that kind of thing, uh, either in the review room or in the uh, in the interview uh, room. Uh, and then uh, there there will be a, a half an hour total time allowed for the interview itself. So you need to budget your time uh, to make sure that you're allowed. You're going to have enough time to answer all four of those questions. That's about seven and a half minutes per question. Sometimes you just throw everything out and it takes you three minutes to get through everything. If you cover everything, that's okay. Uh, but you may wanna think about, okay, what else can I add to this question, okay? So that's kind of the basic process. Make sure you get there early enough that you're not feeling rushed and you're, you know, you make, you make uh, provision for traffic if there's traffic on the way getting to and from. You want to do everything you can to set yourself up for success on these on these workshops. So, so plan ahead, get there a little bit early, you know, 15, 20 minutes early. Make sure that you're there, you're you're breathing <laughs> when you're ready to go. Okay, so we don't want anyone to faint in the process. All right. The general types of questions that could be asked are things like administration, management, supervision, sexual harassment, prevention, labor relations. There are gonna be some questions about program policies and planning, uh, maybe starting up a new type of program, maybe implementing, how, how would you go about implementing new regulations? Uh, they're gonna ask something uh, at, at, in on some of these uh, exams at least about how you know where your revenues are coming from, how you budget for uh, dealing with your programs. Uh, if there's you know a need for a budget reduction, how do you go about that? Those kind of things. Uh, there could be some questions about public relations. You know whether you want to be proactive, whether you want to do press releases, social media, or uh, you know how you react to the press when they show up on the spot and stick a microphone in front of your face. So. You, you need to be prepared, you know, maybe even a scenario that, you know, you, you've you been notified of a certain incident and uh, you're on site and, you know, they, they ask you to, to stand up and make a presentation about that. That could be, uh, you usually is one of your first questions. They ask you to do kind of a, a mock presentation to the panel uh, and put you into kind of a, a you know, real life type of situations, okay? With that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over at this point to Mr. Arroyo, and uh, he'll talk to you about pesticide regulations, and I'll go ahead and forward these slides for you, Ruben, when you're ready to go forward. Okay, so in, in any oral panel, you have to know about our partners. And that it's our partner starting from, if we're talking about the Department of Pesticide Regulation, know how the program works. You know, we were granted authority by the Environmental Protection Agency way back when to even allow the state to have a, a pesticide program that we can enforce locally at the state level. Uh, with that, that came the commissioners uh, to work in the, under in the field at a certain point with CDFA, and then when DPR branched out and became under part of Cal EPA, um, we followed along with that and, and, and followed along with the director at uh, DPR as far as the program is concerned in the enforcement end of that. Now, just right there, I just mentioned three different partners as far as of the history there, you know, EPA, Cal EPA, CDFA, and now DPR. Now, you don't necessarily need to understand dates and times and all that, but at least know, I mean, if you if you have that information or if you need help with that information, most of it's on the DPR website. Um, 
So no, just knowing some of that information, because just about every question that you're going to receive in an oral panel, whether it's at the deputy level or at the commissioner level, you have to tie in that, that information of, of partnership. You know, how does that flow, whether it's through funding, whether it's through the branches, whether it's through uh, how we, we are funded and how that money gets spent. You have to tie in that, that relationship. And I don't care if you're doing the sealer or deputy sealer or commissioner or, or deputy commissioner, always remember that they're looking for that partnership as well in your answer in every question. Uh, at least the mentioning that, you know, if I need some training or I need some help, uh, you know, I'm going to go to my state partner at CDFA or DPR to help me with that. And then at, you know, it, it, it always comes up. They always want to know, do you know uh, the department? You know, do you know their programs? Uh, do you know how many agencies they have? Um, and, you know, and, and what they do, whether it's the health and safety, the enforcement branch and, and the pest management, the licensing, registration, uh, monitoring, uh, worker health and safety. Do you know all of those? And do you know what they do for each of those? You know, most of the time we're working with the enforcement branch. Um, as far as the inspectors and even at the commissioner level, we're, we're dealing right now because of we enforce their program, um, at least for the enforcement end of that. And so just know um, all of those. Um, Cal EPA, that comes up from time to time as far as the departments and functions. I can't recall in, in the last 12 years or so that they, that, that was a specific uh, mention and Ed, maybe you can help me out. I, I don't recall that, but just knowing that there is a, 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 an overlying body there that the Department of Pesticide Regulation is, it falls under that, at least that umbrella. Now, the funding, um, again, I don't care if you're taking the weights and measure side or the ag side, um, you have to know your funding structures. And that's, if, of course, at the department level with uh, the pesticide regulation, that, that's the mill. Now, I'm actually bringing up a slide, uh, and I didn't bring it with me, but I'm uh, at our um, at our conference. Uh, my whole point in the mill is: Do you know the criteria of the mill, and do you know? And you, and again, a lot of times because of the issues that are coming up with the budget change proposal that DPR is looking at and in increasing the mill, that's how they're funded as well. Um, and right now they're claiming that there's a shortfall and that we need to have some issues with enforcement, which, you know, the, again, there's another argument there to be made as far as enforcement and what that means, because that's us, that we, we enforce for them. But anyway, getting back to the funding, you know, we have a, a, a mill structure and, and what you need to understand at whether it's at the deputy level, you know, how are you maintaining that funding level at the deputy level? So in order to understand that, you have to understand how much money you get from year to year. Uh, again, that, that's what I'm reminding my commissioners of uh, this next week. Do you know how much mill you get? So if you're taking this exam, I always tell, and, and when I did that KSAP uh, oral uh, presentation or that, that thing, I, I gave a few hints as far as you know, when I used to take these exams and, and I've been listening in on them and participating as, as a panelist for just about 12 years now, off and on. And it's, it's always nice to hear from a deputy or potential deputy or for potential commissioner that they know their local program. They know how much mill they get, you know, and, and if you're talking about the mill in general and knowing the criteria, knowing how much you get out of that percentage and there's like about six seven levels of, of criteria some are at 40 percent some are at 20 percent 21 percent and the others are at three percent how many of those can you affect in a program there's only about three so knowing that information and knowing what you can do at the local level to increase your portion of the mill is, I mean, that's gonna put you right above anybody else that's answering the general question about mill. And so if you understand what you're getting through the mill, how you receive it and what you're doing for that, you know, how many inspections or how many hours are you putting into the program? How many inspections do you do? And, and it's just one of those things that puts you over and above anybody else that may not be uh, even thinking about that. 
And so how, how does DPR provide that funding? You know, well, it's, it's all of it's, again, it's all calculated as at least the mill is concerned and is uh, all based on that formula. And, and it's, you know, we get a check right around April or so. And, and all of that information is, is, in the, um, is, in the, is in California Code of Regulations. And it's pretty easy to find. Again, all you have to do is type in mill on, on the DPR website and you're gonna get a ton of information. And, and after this is all done, if you guys have any questions, um, you know, in Riverside County, we put together a lot of sheets and I think a lot of counties have probably done that for study material and um, have talked about the mill and, and, and in general, at least history and, and how it's all calculated and how we receive it and when we receive it. But remember that when you're talking about funding levels, there are other things that you can do uh, and have done. Like right now, uh, Ed and I are in a um, pilot program and it's funded through DPR from a funding source that the governor had given uh, DPR about $2 million, I believe it was, to start a statewide notification program. So that is another funding source. Uh, and when we talk about funding, uh, what, what other types of funding do you have that plays into your department as far as the pesticide regulation is concerned? But you should also know your funding levels anyway, whether it's unclaimed gas tax, mill tax, contracts, any of that. Uh, know what you're doing uh, when, we're, when, when you're talking or trying to answer. It always helps, especially, like I said, if you can bring it back to even to your own county, perfect. That, that's just going to help you answer that question even further. Um, again, when we talk about DPR and its mission, you know, it, I think their mission has changed over the years, but and I think in general, it's to protect human health and the environment uh, by regulating pesticide sales and use. And I'm highlighting that. I think there's probably more, but uh, know your mission, know your county mission, know CACASA's mission, and know the, the CD, uh, CDPR and CDFA's mission. Uh, division of measurement standards. I mean, know them all. Uh, it, it never hurts to, to just have that extra information because you're going to be studying their programs and, and their uh, agencies that fall under that and are not the agencies, but the programs anyway. The, like under DPR, I think there's like nine programs. Know a little bit about them. Um, and with that, there always seems to come up um, right now. I think last year we were dealing with, uh, with a lot of uh, CEQA equivalency. And so in order to answer a question about CEQA equivalency, you have to know about restricted material permits. Again, how many permits do you issue in your county? It doesn't hurt to throw that in there. Um, you know, do you know what you're doing in order to meet CEQA in that restricted materials permit? You know, what, what is it all about? What does CEQA mean and, and its equivalency? And all it is basically is that we're creating an exemption so that we don't have to follow the CEQA process for every pesticide applied onto a piece of ground. Well, how do we do that? We do it through the restricted materials permit, through the issuance, through actually issuing a pesticide for each um, site location. We, and if it's a restricted material, we have a notice of intent and we have a process through that. And so all these things play into answering a question and you have to really listen to the question and because I've seen this happen uh, quite a bit where there's a question uh, that's being asked. And um, for instance, like, let's say they're asking about restricted materials and, and we're looking at the CEQA equivalency, um, you know, in, in the state right now. And there was a UCLA study that came out that triggered this program uh, for us to have to maintain what changes were made at the commissioner level in order to meet the sequel equivalency. Sometimes people will look at that and start asking and answering the question about the restricted materials permit when actually the, what we were asking is what did we change in the restricted materials percent permit process. And so if you get a panelist that kind of prompts you to and or either stops you or prompts you think about what you're saying and, and listen to what the prompt is. Uh, they may be trying to push you in another direction. And so that, again, um, the sequel equivalency, um, you know, that's when we started looking at what we were doing and looking at what it actually says in regulation, working through DPR legal, uh, and then eventually coming to the situation where, where we're in now. And that's where we're having to ask our growers and our applicators 
about the use of those pesticides and have they looked at any alternatives and now we're having to document it. And it's all about maintaining a program statewide that we're all doing in the same manner. And that was the biggest issue that came out in the UCLA study is that we weren't actually doing that. We weren't doing um, the same thing in each of the counties. We weren't answering the questions about alternatives uh, when we probably should have, or at least been documenting it somewhere. And so uh, again, uh, moving on, I mean, at least as far as the, this is a talk about, talking about the, or at least the slide here, um, the PUE program, I mean, it's all, when you talk about a PUE program, it's about maintaining your mill, at least that's in my mind, as far as a program is concerned, it's about ma maintaining your funding. Um, as a commissioner, that's all our goals is either to maintain or increase funding so we can keep the staff that we have. Um, and as far as the DPR program, the pesticide program, we all have work plans that we're supposed to be following. Uh, and that's all, you know, it's an performance evaluation. And my biggest thing with performance evaluation is that I don't want to know about it in the end. It's something that should be ongoing. Our EBLE should be talking to commissioners, should be talking to our deputies about where we are in our work plans. Are you, do you even know about your work plan? Do you know in general how many, you know, fumigations or field workers or whatever it is that you've decided on through your commissioner or deputy, what you're supposed to be doing? Um, so know, again, know your program, know your hours, know your work, you know, how many inspections you're supposed to be doing. And um, the next one is the Sustainable Agriculture and Integrated, Integrated Pest Management Working Group. Again, why is all this coming about? And it's because of what the governor wants and what the EJ groups are looking at and what they call sustainable, sustainable agriculture. Uh, when we talk about integrated pest management or IPM, our growers have been doing that since the beginning of time when we talk about this, but it seems to be a buzzword right now. Uh, so the state has developed this uh, program post um, clopyrifos. Um, so, and, and it's been kind of some rough waters. We have a commissioner that sits on that working group and, and is struggling with the information that's coming out and the pressures of the environmental justice groups. And I mean, when we talk about a sustainable program, you know, what is the exactly does that mean? And you can look online and see the information that's coming out out of that group. And, and it looks a little one sided. And, and as far as what they're looking at with biopesticides, or no pesticide use at all. A lot of people on those groups think that we think that we can maintain the structure of agriculture without or limited use of pesticides, um, not necessarily understanding that organic pesticides aren't necessarily the answer or biopesticides aren't necessarily the answer. And when we talk about a big picture of, of pesticide use, we're also talking about quarantine uh, use and, and they're not really talking about that. So um, get to know those three, I guess, uh, in at least those three bullets there um, and wouldn't hurt to maintain and, and keep on top of what's going on with the pilot programs because this, it, 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 all, it, it all works together. Whether you're talking about sustainable agriculture whether you're talking about your program or even the CEQA equivalency, it, it, these are all these issues here are based on environmental justice concerns and the pressures that the governor is getting. And he's only seeing one side of it and pushing it down to his cabinet, which is again, no understanding this. The governor has a cabinet. One is the secretary of agriculture, Karen Ross. And then the other cabinet member is Jared Blumenfeld under Cal EPA. Under Cal EPA is DPR. A DPR is not a cabinet seat. It's an appointee and that's why they're called a director and not a secretary. So she basically has marching orders from Cal EPA to work on these issues, work on the sequel equivalency, work on the integrated pest management working group, work on the reduction of pesticides. So Again, and, and part of that is, is the pilot programs. And that's what we're trying to come up with and, and at least a, a valid 
maybe a, and I shouldn't say a valid, maybe a, a program that could work in this state when in regards to a, a notification of restricted materials statewide. Um, second gen uh, rodenticides um, has been on probably on the, the radar of this this um, panel probably for the last four or five years, at least that I can remember their um, uh, reduction uh, every year seems there's always an assembly bill, whether it's in wildlife or, you know, it, um, and it's pretty much gone for a lot of um, in city use uh, situations. So just brush up on the second gen. Um, I kind of mentioned already the mill assessment uh, regulations and disbursements. Um, that again is is on the table. It, it may be too soon for this to be on a on an oral panel right now, but again, wouldn't hurt to understand at least the whole process and a brief overview with what's currently happening with the BCP right now. Um, material evaluation and review process. Um, that issue is comes when you talk about the industry and our manufacturers and trying to keep up with this demand for, again, integrated pest management, you know, we've gotten away from the harsh pesticides, the all kill pesticides in the state. If you look at a 10, 15 year usage of restricted materials, um, you know, those harsher type pesticides that have gone either, they've, they've been removed from use or uh, being reduced now. We have a lot of pesticides that are, are being used that are specific to killing certain insects. Now, if you look at the entire process that a manufacturer has to go through it uh, from beginning to end, because they have to go to EPA, and this again, this is a process you should know, in order to get a pesticide uh, approved for use in the United States, it has to get approved by the Environmental Protection Agency at the US, US level. And so the label, and that's why the label is the law when your inspectors are out there, that it's a federal law. Uh, and then we have our own state laws, which include the material evaluation and review process to have a pesticide registered for use in California as well. So the manufacturers go through EPA, can use that pesticide in probably 90% of the United States except California. They have to go through another rigorous evaluation of that pesticide and review to see if it meets their criteria in California. Now, the big, the big issue right now is the timing of that. How long does it take? Uh, I think beginning and end to end from the, what I've heard, um, uh, I see a question, can you clarify budget? It's a budget change proposal. Uh, when a department, even at your county level, wants to um, increase their budget, um, we have to go through a process at the county level to ask our board uh, through a form, ours is called a Form 11 in, in Riverside County, to ask for money basically to supplement our budget. The state departments do something like that as well. They ask, it's a budget change proposal and they have to, one, establish a need for that increase in revenue from the governor. And they have to go through hearings and that's what they're going through right now in order to get approval and it has to go through the Office of Administrative Law Review and it has to go to the co committee of our legislature, uh, again, in hearings to prove that they need that, that budget change. Um, so that's what a BCP is. Um, we're always trying to help uh, at least CDFA in their budget change proposals or at least get some in there for some of our programs. It is, we aren't necessarily successful all the time but right now, uh, DPR is looking at trying to increase their funding level uh, two ways. One is they're trying to increase the mill, and they're also trying to increase funding levels for their enforcement program. Um, and uh, they're trying to staff up some people for uh, the attorney general's office. And so anyway, so I don't want to take up too much time, but yeah, that's what a BCP is. Um, hey, Ed, can you go back when I forgot what I was talking oh, about? Sorry, Ruben. Yeah. Um, oh, the evaluation process. So I, I think from beginning to end between the feds and the state, I think it's about an eight to 10 year process. So they're trying to figure out to streamline that process. They're going, uh, I think they're, they've purchased a program uh, for online use registration. And, um, and, and I'm assuming that's what that bullet was for. Um, but okay. Move on, Ed. 
And I think also, Ruben, the, there's, you know, these pesticides are subject to re-evaluation uh, ah, okay. periodically as well. So just remember that and it basically has to go through a very similar process to get re, you know, re-approved sometimes. Yeah, and there's a few of those that are in re-evaluation right now. And then the department and through their worker health and safety are, are posed with ensuring that if there are, are materials out there that are harming the environment, um, then they have, or people, then they have to reevaluate and see if they can be re-registered re again for use. Um, so the federal state county complaint resolution coordination, that's been on the books for some time now. Um, CASPIR was developed by uh, DPR a few years ago. Um, at that time, I think there, I think there is still a U.S. Uh, oops, are we still there? Uh, sorry, um, there's still uh, I think a, a state, no, a federal line that they can use. But this CASPIR was supposed to kind of combine all these different complaints that we had and. Um, there is a process through our MOU when it comes to um, um, complaints and when it, it's, it's a priority. Uh, again, that's another one. You need to know your MOUs and because it actually explains the, the partnership and how we communicate with both, all three of us. And when it comes to uh, pesticide uh, investigations, priorities, and who we're supposed to be talking to in so many days. So understand your MOUs. There's, I think about nine or 10 of them out there. If you're just taking the, the commissioner, probably wouldn't hurt to just know that they're out there and if you can just say a few things about them. They, you know, back in the day, they'd actually want to know specifics about each MOU um, or a space, you know, want to know all the specifics about an assembly bill. And it, that's just not the case anymore. They made it a little easier. And if you just know about them and know what they're for uh, and, 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 uh, and can name a few things about what's in them, uh, you, you'll, be, you'll do just fine. Now, these, this next one, this illness and property damage response and investigation, um, you know, if you're taking the deputy, find someone or know somebody or give me a call um, and know about a drift scenario. If, if you're not in a county that has one, um, you know, I would, I, what I would suggest is looking at a quarantine scenario and look at a drift scenario. There are a lot of things that have to occur, especially when you're talking about a priority about what you need to do um, and prepare yourself and, and not just in the field with taking samples and how, what kind of sample are you going to take? And, 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 and when we're talking about interviews and working with our emergency responders and uh, working with our state partners, again, they always want to hear that, you know, what are you going to do uh, when you get a call from, you know, the 911 dispatch that you've got 15 field workers that potentially have been uh, sprayed with the pesticide. You're the commissioner. You're going to get that call. Your deputy is going to get that call. What do you do? Who are you going to call? Who are you going to contact? Um, you know, it, it it's always good to know that stuff ahead of time, and um, and they have been on the exam before uh, about drifts a few years ago, and and it's still on the director's you know um, dartboard about trying to fix this problem about drift, and and so know about what you need to do uh, in in any of that, whether it's an illness, a drift, or property damage. Um, grab some old NOPAs if you can find them and, and look at the investigation or talk to uh, your deputy, talk to your commissioner. Uh, like I said, give me a call. I'm working on one right now on a property damage. Um, and I've done uh, way too many uh, illness and investigations and, and um, priority investigations in my former career in Kern County. So just know what you need to do. Um, again, here's the uh, US EPA DPR Cucasa MOU uh, regarding that. We have a cooperative agreement. Uh, know what you need to do there. And it, it, it just breaks it down into a communication line on who's supposed to tell who, whether they get a complaint at US EPA or if DPR gets it, and how we're going to communicate with each other. That's basically what all that does. Uh, structural pest control enforcement. Um, I don't know exactly what, what, what that bullet's for, but again, Sorry, it's, part, it's part, no, it's okay. It's part of your program. 
again, you know, you know, what, what are you doing in the structural arena and how does that relate with the structural pest control board? We have counties in the state, and this is that other funding mechanism I was telling you about that get paid through an assembly bill to do structural pest control work in the tarping inspections arena of a fumigation, a house fumigation. Uh, they're by contract have to do so many and Jose I think is on the line and, and um, he, I think he probably knows more about that than I do, but, um, but I think it's um, LA, San Diego and a few other counties that are in there that are getting paid through that. And it's again, it's a funding mechanism uh, that's part of the, uh, the, the pesticide program. Uh, residue report findings. Um, now, I'm, I've been looking at this pretty closely um, as far as what's happening because of this integrated pest management arena program. And there's a thing called the Chamaco study. I think I saw Shayla on the line. Uh, that study came out of Monterey County um, and has been used in the BCP in the original hearing to, I guess, quantify why, I shouldn't say quantify, I think justify why the department needs to increase enforcement. And this gets into this residue arena. Now, if you look at what the state does, and there's a couple of programs, there's a federal residue program, and then there's a state residue program. Commissioners used to be part of the, the residue program. We'd go out and take samples, but more for the most part now, it, it's the DPR that does it. And they put out a, a report every year and wouldn't hurt to get that report. I think it just came out um, about, I think it's like a 98 percent, uh, 98, 99 uh, percent clearance of California grown products that have that either have a residue that meets tolerance or, or, or no tolerance. Now, we do find. Uh, some from time to time, but far and few between, between, and I forget, and I don't have the results in front of me right now, but it's a very low number, but we do find some that don't have any tolerance or um, there isn't a tolerance, so it's an illegal use of pesticide. And so those always come up from time to time. But if you look at the general picture of what's happening and in, in whether it's the United States or California grown products, they're pretty darn clean. Now, if you look at what's coming in from Mexico and a few other ones, uh, there's a high percentage of of residue there are for pesticides we can't even use in California anymore. And I think that directly affects some of these things called like the Chamaco study. And I don't know if, if the Chamaco study takes into account what they're eating and where they're buying their food. And they always seem to want to just blame ag, California ag, in the reasons why they're finding organophosphates and some of these other things in the bloodstream. So know what's going on and how that fits into your program and why we're even out there, you know, know how, again, how many inspections you do in, in your county for field workers to protect the, that situation. Um, it, it just, it just helps, uh, especially as a commissioner, knowing that information, knowing that we do 30,000 inspect inspections statewide a year, and we have a 98.5% compliance rate for all that. So, um, just know your program, and I can't I can't emphasize that enough. Know about what's going on, um, you know, statewide. If you're the commissioner, definitely know your program. If you're taking the deputy, um, it, it it will never hurt. And again, DPR organization functions. I think I mentioned that already. Um, it, it's 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 easy information, and it's it's dreadful reading, but uh, just uh, once hopefully and study. And that, that's the huge thing. I remember when I was taking these things, I had flashcards and I actually had a few people to study with and we would ask each other, all right, tell me what about DPR, its goals, its mission and, and the functions of the department and just sit there and belch it out, man. I mean, it's just, you just have to just do it and understand it. And you only have to take that deputy once, hopefully And the, I had to take the commissioner, I think three times before I passed it, but I did. And, um, you know, and then it all comes, it all comes to you later when you have to actually get up in front of the podium and explain to things to other commissioners and other board members and staff about why you're doing things. Why, why are we even out there? You know, we're there to protect the environment. We're there to protect every constituent in the state of California to ensure that we're using pesticides safely. And because we have a 98.2 compliance rate, it, I think it shows, and we have an oversight, you know, people, Ebels that come in and over, oversee our inspections. So 
Um, anyway, if, if you have any ever have any questions, uh, just give me uh, shoot me an email, shoot me a call. Um, I'll type in my information in the chat here in a second. So uh, again, uh, thank you for your time and, and listening in. Ruben, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. I kind of I kind of made some last minute changes to these slides and Ruben picked it up on the fly. So uh, I, I, if, if you have any questions whatsoever about uh, pesticide program or DPR, Ruben is the guru uh, amongst us ag commissioners in that regard. So thank you very much. Uh, our next section is going to be about uh, measurement standards, uh, or uh, unless there's any quick questions for Ruben uh, that that we want to get answered uh, briefly. I'm not following the uh, chat very well. Jose posted some information about the uh, structural fumigation uh, program as well. So thank you very much. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to measurement standards and Angela Godwin, the uh, sealer commissioner from San Bernardino County. You're on mute, Angela. You're muted, I believe, Angela. That. Okay. There we go. There we go. Um, can you pick, um, I made a lot of slides. We didn't communicate real well. Okay. I don't know if we want to, I can kind of take you through that and make sure I'm touching upon these items that you have. Let me go ahead sure. and let me go ahead and stop share here and I'll go ahead and uh, you can go ahead and put yours up uh, at this point. Okay, perfect. Well, let me get back just a little bit. Trying to make sure eh, it's giving me problems here. Sorry, guys. Okay, well, I wanted to go over some of the current, uh, the current weights and measures issues first, which I identified as electric vehicle charging stations. Uh, Waymaster surveys that recently were completed, uh, walnut, tomato, e-waste, pu um, public scales, rock, sand, and gravel, the minimum test weight and load sales uh, proposal from uh, DMS, uh, funding sources, and maybe the DMS admin fee increase, even though I think that might actually be um, a little too premature. I mean, a little too, um, that was the past, the past question, but um, Let's see what we can do and get this going here. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble navigating with all these uh, the screens. Let's see what I'm seeing for you. Okay, well, let's talk about electric vehicle charging stations first. This seems to be an uh, it's an ongoing issue, but it's getting to the point now. It's 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 we're actually putting it into place. We're following up on this. Um, in case anyone doesn't know electrical, we call it EVS, electric vehicle charging stations. It's when it's used for commercial purposes and it's subject to regulation and oversight by weights and measures. We have some new authorities. I have all this down in a PowerPoint. So if anybody wants this PowerPoint that's not playing very well, I would be glad to give you my email and I'll provide it directly too. Um, all um, AC electric vehicle charging stations installed after January 1st are subject to regulation. And all DC charging stations installed after January 2023 are subject to regulations. And now we have the handbook section 44 uh, from NIST and uh, section 3.40. It's going to be removed from tentative status. And we have an issue where registered service agents must report work to counties. Uh, some of the big issues with electric vehicle charging stations is the registration. Um, municipality issues, equipment, training, considerations and testing, such as frequency, registration fee, compliance rate, and some of the statistics. And we don't have a lot of statistics right now. That's one of the goals of, that we want to develop. Let me see if I can get this slide. Um, like you said, we're kind of moving forward as some counties are starting to register. 
A lot of us were waiting to get the testing standards, which were very expensive. I've listed on these slides, which I can make available, the DMS notices that relate to electric vehicle charging stations. And actually there's at least four or five that I think are very useful. Uh, currently we've also, we're dealing with the issue of what do we charge? Uh, right now it's under other devices, but we wanna collect data on that. Um, and we'll need time to study, you know, is this fee right? Is, you know, when we actually are out doing it. Uh, there's a municipality issue, which I think people, is a fair question. Uh, if they know about an old attorney general opinion letter that was a DMS notice way back in 1978, and that was recently confirmed by DMS notice D2006, that they give a rationale that cities are exempt and we don't have jurisdiction to test. This has come up under other issues, but it's gonna be very important with the electrical vehicle charging station because a lot of cities are providing them. We would have to have some new legislation to amend uh, the code section that they cite, which it's more of a definition. And um, they, the choice has been so far, let's let's do some, start doing inspections, see what the compliance rates are, and and then maybe move forward with trying to change that. Or and some people are talking about getting uh, memorandums of understanding to test for the cities. Um, big issue with electric vehicle charging stations is the standards. Some of us have purchased them already. Uh, I'm just in the process of purchasing them. They're very expensive. I just bought the Tesco with the upgrade package. It's supposed to cover for the next few years at $71,000. Uh, DMS has five units that are apparently gonna be able to be on loan at some point when they receive them. Some of the suggestions have been, you know, lease agreement, sharing between counties, both formal and informal. Uh, we're all kind of hoping in the future Manufacture, more manufacturers might produce these standards. Uh, there's a lot of concern how long these standards are good for. It's one of the reasons we added on the 20 something thousand upgrade package. So at least it'll take us maybe five to 10 years before it's obsolete. Uh, again, I recommend there's quite a few DMS notices and Ed had put on here DMS notices and they're very useful. There just haven't been a lot in the last few years, but they're on GMS's website and their communications either on general, device, Waymaster, QC, which doesn't happen much anymore, metrology, but they're very useful uh, policy uh, or law and reg interpretations from DMS. Um, trainings available, they, there's now a field reference in the CCR that combines California's changes with Handbook 44 section, the 2020. Uh, so Tesco website has training and if you buy their equipment, they will come out and train. It's actually a very easy test. There's a lot of questions on maybe how you pay for it. Can you do, can you do witness testing? Um, how are we gonna get reimbursed for it? But it's still a, a very much up and coming issue. Um, another another um, topic that might, I think is fair game would be the DMS Waymaster surveys. There were four done between 20 20 and 2021, including the industries of uh, walnuts, tomatoes, e-waste, public scales, rock sand, and gravel. Uh, as you're looking on the slide, you can see that the compliance rates were very low uh, in, in most categories. There's a, there, again, there's DMS notices for each of these. This was brought up at spring conference last, um, this last spring conference, and there was extreme concern by Kakasa, how low the levels of non-compliance are, or how high the levels of non-compliance are. Uh, we didn't see these levels of non-compliance back when the counties were getting larger, much larger, or actually getting subvention to do these inspections. Um, there was a, even a, a motion made to the board that we maybe support, we're not doing it yet, but support increasing the Waymaster fees to return subvention monies to the county so they can help do it, help do these inspections in their county, which again, the compliance rates were much higher at that point. DMS is spread very thin. They can't follow up on all these, but these are pretty, considering the importance of Waymasters, there, there was, this is a pretty pitiful, I think, compliance rate. And I think this could be fair game for a question. 
could be about resources or ways to solve it. Like I said, CASA was proposing sponsoring something to increase the Waymaster uh, fees charge that would help with, a, with the caveat that some of it had to go to the counties. Currently, we only have a junk, small junk dealer contracts. Um, there's another issue that's is gonna be on the agenda at spring conference. It's a regulation that DMS is proposing to change. They recently did a survey. It involves the minimum test loads. Uh, we chose, I'm not even sure quite why, but in the past, we didn't adopt the table four and section N.3 from handbook 44, which really specifies a minimum amount of test loads you're supposed to use. The looking at this sort of, it came from service agents that were com complaining that they had competition from other service agents that showed up with hardly any weight at all, a thousand pounds, maybe 500. Whereas the service agents that invested in the proper amount of heavy capacity weights couldn't keep up with their bids or the competition, but the scales were not, um, were failing tolerances as soon as you put a little higher amount of weight. And so the survey was sent out to each county with sort of the concern of, will the counties themselves have enough weight to meet these standards? Uh, so I'm in support of it. I think you really have to do a minimum amount of weight, but again, this, this, this is kind of an up and coming issue and it will be on the spring conference. And depending on what DMS decides with our input, they could be looking at changing, it would be a regulation change. Uh, so that just a little heads up on that. There's always a question, I don't know if it's on here, but, but you know, DMS funding sources, uh, it's a lot, a lot fewer sources than in the ag side, but we have some ditching contacts with uh, CDFA and DMS, including petroleum inspections, the Waymaster Junk and Recycling Dealers I mentioned earlier. And then we always get a RSA reimbursement based on the program hours we report on our car. It's not a lot, usually four to $5,000. Um, the main source of most county weights and measures funding is the county annual registration fees. We have the registration fee in BMP code section 12240 through 12246. Recently, AB 155 from Cooper extended our sunset to January 2027, with, but no increases. I, some of this was coming off COVID. Everybody was just wanting to make sure we still had our base support, but not really feeling the political climate to go for an increase. In spring conference, um, Kakasa discussed this. Because there's a feeling that especially certain things like water meters at $2 an hour, it just, we're not even coming close to recovering our costs. Some counties report they're, they're like, maybe 60% of their costs are covered with their fees and, and the other 40 isn't. A subcommittee was created seeking to um, come up with some statistics and an approach to increase device fees before the sunset. Um, the last exam, I think there was a recent sealer question related to what happens if the sunset isn't renewed? What does, I mean, what, what would that mean to county funding? If for some reason, there's a lot of opposition. We don't back down and the sunset's not renewed. What was the, the impact would be like lack of uniformity. Uh, this, this sets the maximum for counties and some people, some counties actually, their ordinances are tied to this. So it could create a lack of uniformity <clears throat> and the program could suffer. Some counties have price verification and package fees uh, under county ordinances. Uh, I think there's five, at least five that have the combination. And I wanna say 28 to 30 that have some sort of price verification ordinance that supports them by uh, bringing in uh, per registration permits for price verification. Another source that we don't like to necessarily think of as, as a funding source, but it, you do have to consider it because it's very hard to you know, determine what it's gonna be is there's penalties from civil administrative penalties and cost recovery um, that can vary quite a bit. And then there's general fund contributions. So for some of those that counties that are only getting 60% of their costs recovered by registration fees, they could have up to 40% of general fund money supporting them. Recently, and I, this might be a little old, but there was a DMS admin fee increase. This is the first one I wanna say 10 to 11 years. It was pretty significant. It doubled 
the device fees on all, on all devices with the exception of submeters and those were increased five times. So what was 10 cents per meter went to 50 cents per meter. Uh, and they also de decreased the county admin portion that we can make, uh, retain for processing this from 15 to 12%. Same regulation touched upon device inspection frequencies and, all, and kind of eliminated any lingering old alternative frequencies of inspection. I put this on just because it's useful. The California, you know, it's where our weights and measures authorities come from. The Business Profession Code Division 5, California Code of Regulations. Um, some of them are adopted from the handbooks. I've listed them here. Did I? Uh, and we have DMS can make proposed regulations and we have county ordinances. Keep looking at the list, Ed, that I hope I'm covering the issues you want. There's weights and measures resources that I think every websites are great anymore. Uh, National Conference, NIST, Office of Weights and Measures, the Western Weights and Measures, Leginfo, uh, Liaison Reports, the CACASA Handbook, um, the CASA's YouTube, uh, the Conference Minutes. And I believe it's the YouTube, CACASA YouTube channel that this presentation is going to um, appear on in a few days. We have Memorandums of Understanding. Uh, and if you can get a hold of regional deputy minutes, I think that's very useful too. Thought they were being posted on CACASA's website. Um, covering a little bit about the organization of Weights and Measures in the United States. There's no federal program. It's um, sort of a state's right issue. There are over 750 state, county, and city Weights and Measures jurisdiction in the US. Um, the state director and county sealers are vested by enforcing the BMP code section five and the CCR that we know of. DMS is charged with general supervision of weights and measures activities. They represent California at both Western Weights and Measures and National Conference of Weights and Measures. Uh, they issue instructions, policies, recommendations. These are often in the form of DMS notices. This, some of this is coming out of our MOU, the MOU of mutual objectives that are in the CACASA handbook. They help develop regulations. If a law passes, DMS will generally develop a regulation to define that as how it, it affects us. Um, the county sealers of weights and measures are represented in the CACASA. And um, I think it, it, someone else is gonna cover CACASA, so I'm just really not gonna touch upon it too much. It just, it does have a big effect with the sealers. Um, I think this is a little bit of a duplicate. Um, these are the programs we generally have. This uh, is mirrored at both the um, DMS level and the county level. Uh, we don't do, uh, DMS pretty much holds the field in metrology. It's been a little frustrating, you know, just the um, getting everything certified. Um, and they regulate the registered service agents and do a type evaluation. Um, I, you mentioned, uh, I'm not sure if you were talking about legislative changes or regulation changes you mentioned, Ed, but these are, are often sponsored through the CACASA if we do want to make a change. Sometimes we're dealing with other bills that have been sponsored and CACASA will take, the sealers, CACASA sealers will take a support, oppose, or neutral position. Um, always tell people to go over their, their how a law become, how the, the rulemaking process, the Office of Administrative Law, this affects us quite often. I'm gonna keep moving because I think everybody has some of these charts and it, but it is something that's very fundamental to understanding. Um, some of the organizations we deal with in California to realize that DMS is, you know, our authority throw, flows through CDFA to DMS to the counties and from Cal EPA to DPR to the counties. Um, in CACASA, we have regional groups and, and under which are also regional uh, deputy groups. In at the national level, the, term, the organizations you're gonna see is National Conference of Weights and Measures, both their annual, their interim, and then we have our regional, which is we call Western Weights and Measures here. Uh, the form 15 is generally, um, is the way we add something. Um, I'll talk about that a little more as we go on, NIST has a strong role as our advisory. Um, the handbooks are technically published by them, but what goes in them is regulated by what happens at the national conference. Um, 
it's good to know what the national conference is. It's a nonprofit agency. It's been around a very long time. There were significant revisions um, in the past 20, 30 years where they, they started to actually hit, take more of a role with the, um, the handbooks, which are considered national standards. I tend to think of standards as weights and provers, but these handbooks are actually considered recognized written standards. Um, the, the role of NIST is, again, it changed from being much more active in, in the actual publication and running to it's more of an advisory now, but it's a very valuable advisory. They keep uniformity and it, it's, it, I never met it. It's just, they're essential to what we do. Um, I think it's important to know the handbooks. As I've covered on here, we have handbook 44, which is adopted by reference, especially in California. Occasionally there'll be a little area that's not or something that's changed, but for the, I'd say 95% uh, at least is, is directly in uh, our California Code of Regulations. And this handbook 133 has model laws and regulations. You'll, you'll see they'll cover things from fuels to Waymaster to uh, the national model of price verification, fair package and labeling. Uh, and then we have handbook 133, which we adopt completely by reference, and that's for checking contents of packaging. Um, there are some additional handbooks that are worth knowing about. Handbook 105, which is your standards and improving. A great reference, I think, for um, deputies and sealers is Handbook 155. Weights and Measures Program Requirements is for the Weights and Measures Administrator. Uh, a lot of people aren't aware of it. You can go find it on the website. Um, it's got some really good information, you know, uh, alternative inspection frequencies, a lot of great definitions. If you haven't looked at it, especially at the sealer level, I think it's a great resource. Um, we have regional, just touching upon what Western way to measures is to, we have four regions in the country. We're part of the Western and these associations meet preliminary to the, the interim at national and then the agenda to, to kind of vet any proposals or carryover items as it comes through. And um, I have to say the Western way to measures is it's very highly respected with their opinions. Um, just adding that. Um, both National Conference of Weights and Measures and the uh, Western Weights and Measures have the same structure, which too bad I didn't spell it right. Um, they have membership categories of active, which is the state representatives and delegates. You have advisory, which is NIST, um, sometimes some other agencies, uh, associate, which is industry. Uh, you, you recognize these committees, the S&T, the LNR, Professional Development Committee and the National Type Approval. And you have the Board of Directors uh, governing it all. Uh, you'll notice that LNR and s and are also mirrored in the CASA structure. And um, there's, it's always a fair game to get a question like, how does an idea become a national standard? Uh, it's a form 15. I would suggest you look at the form 15, sort of know what it's looking for. This, these are when you've identified a problem with the current standard or there's a void or a standard is needing such as electric vehicle charging. There was nothing in the, in the handbook to deal with that. And that involved both handbook 44 and handbook 130 because you had to give, develop the technical um, standard and then a, law, a model law and reg standard. So, um, these are often, these form 15s can be used by individuals, by industry, by CACASA, which could come up from uh, an area group and deputy level. So and it has to be at least one region is supposed to see these before they move to interim. Ideally, you, you do it early and start with the Western and try to get it through each, um, each regional group. But you submit the form to the National Conference of Ways and Measures and it brings it forward. Um, we, it's, it's an interesting process. Sometimes your ideas just, just don't get accepted. Sometimes there's great ideas that can't seem to come to agreement, but we can talk about that later. Um, a little more on it, um, the, the whole way it goes forward. And if it makes it, if some things just won't be have found to have value. You like, they like it when you're very specific on the code sections you wanna change. Maybe there's a new technology with printed receipts or 
going to virtual receipts, just different things can get touched upon. It can be big or little. If it's big, sometimes you tend to like cannabis or something, sometimes they'll create a subcommittee, um, a working group subcommittee to deal with it. Uh, there's subcommittees for um, the national conference and then NIST will develop national working groups for some bigger items. Um, so do you hear about pub, some of the publications? These are basically agendas with lots of details for the National Conference of Weights and Measures interim meeting where the agenda is set for voting. That's called Pub 15. Uh, I will note that DMS often does a preliminary review of both uh, the publication for both the interim and for annual. Um, pub, pub 16 is what sets is what goes forward to the national annual conference and what and they will have voting designate or designations for an item. I think I get to that in a second, such as voting informational development or withdrawn. These can change. Um, sometimes maybe it's not voted, but a committee at the last minute will decide there's more information needed and they'll downgrade it to informational. Sometimes an item almost passes in uh, there are two houses. I don't know if I have that in here. Um, there are two houses in that have to vote for it. You have the state representatives, and then you have the House of Delegates, which is all other weights and measures. I don't have the numbers, but you have to get a majority in each of them. And sometimes it'll pass one one um, on one side and not the other. And then an item kind of it's like, does it go forward? Does it get kicked back to the regional for work? Um, sort of an interesting um, how things happen sometimes. Um, there's a national type evaluation program. You have the laws and reg committee and you have the specification and tolerance committees. Um, like I said, I can provide this. It's got a lot more detail. We probably have time to go through. I think I'm gonna run out of time soon. Um, and board of directors and there's a professional development one with certifications. Uh, a lot of training, people, there's there's a lot of online training with NIST right now. Uh, and we've come up with some model laws and regs and training programs. There's recently, they recently published a retail motor fuel training. Uh, these are a lot of resources. Um, just to kind of put this in perspective, and I didn't want to make this too confusing, but a lot of times if you're, when you're first starting, it seems like it's very confusing between because you see the same people that are very active in CACASA and, and also at the national and regional conferences. So this is sort of how the timeline works for everybody. Um, you, in January, you have the inter, interim meeting. In July, it, it's where the voting is. And then a new cycle will begin. That's when you have the your regional and the interim to set the agenda and then the actual voting agenda. You can see how that kind of comes across with the spring conferences, with the different conferences of CACASA. Um, ideally, usually each agenda is an update of what's happening and the membership of CACASA will be giving a heads up that there's some item that we, we're really involved in or that we really have an interest in seeing how it goes. It's very much encouraged for CACASA sailors to come go to the regional and the national. It brings a lot of, there's a lot of education during those those conferences and it really keeps you aware of current events. Um, any, any questions? Sorry. Okay. Um, I gave some training. These are not just training resources, but if they ask you about resources in a question, these, these are useful. Plus I think they're, they're, they're very useful places to learn yourself, but these are some of the training resources you can have if they ask you that question. Am I out of time, Ed? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we, we need to go ahead and move to done. See? San Jose's. Uh, okay. you if, finished. If, if anybody wants to call me and has questions, I'm glad to send you the actual. There's a lot more and there's a lot more in the notes. And I'm glad to answer questions. Anything I can do to help. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, if you can put your contact information maybe in the chat, that would I be will. great too. Thank you. So Thank our, you. Next, our next presenter is going to be Jose Arriaga from uh, Orange County, and he's going to talk about CACASA to start with and uh, CDFA programs and such. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. So we'll, uh, let's get started with the CACASA, where since we're on that slide and a little bit about 
Brown, um, as you're going into your exam, I think it's very important to understand the role of CACASA, the official and legal role of CACASA. There, there's an association for agricultural commissioners and sealers. It's A lot of the information needed, I think you're going to be able to find it within the bylaws. If you have not been to, to CACASA's website, I think you should. In there, you're going to find a couple of resources, and I'm going to go over them. But uh, let's let's see here. Do you want to uh, share screen, Jose, or? I, I'll, I'll do that a little bit towards the end. Okay. It's okay. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, but make note, uh, the CACASA bylaws, actually the CACASA handbook is what you're looking for. In the handbook, you're going to find the bylaws, which is very important to be able to read it, understand the structure of CACASA. In addition to that, towards the bottom, of, at the end of the handbook, you're going to find all the MOUs, and that'll give you an insight into all the different uh, relationships, integral relationships between CACASA, which represents all the commissioners and sealers, and the state agencies, not just CDFA and DPR and DMS, but all the other agencies that we have formal agreements with. Uh, those MOUs are very useful to understand the difference. Uh, and all the state and all the different state partners there. We're having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. Sorry. Yeah, can you hear me here? Yes. Keep on looking towards the microphone here. So I remember when I first, uh, when I was studying for my exams and, you know, it was a little bit hard figuring out who are the officers. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, Ed? Yep. I'll, I'll stop sharing here and then you can go ahead and start. Yeah, I found a little cheat sheet that it's very accessible to everybody. What you're seeing here is actually the agenda for the upcoming spring conference next week. Every spring conference and every uh, director and secretary conference, there's an agenda. The format looks very similar. But what you're going to find in this agenda as you scroll through it, Beautiful pictures, by the way, Riverside County. You're going to see a list of the different committees and the topics they're presenting. Over to where you'll get to see everything at the end of the agenda. Get there. <laughs> the week long conference, so there's a lot of topics. The seniority list, you see all that. You get to see where some of the questions may come from when you're doing your exam. Part of the knowledge that I think it's important to have is, you know, who are the officers? The current officers are always going to be listed on their current agendas for CACASA. You have the president, president elect, vice president agriculture, vice president weights and measures, secretary, treasurer, past president, and CACASA has an executive director, uh, Lindsay. Lim this is our executive director. So the board of directors, you'll see the assignments there. Those will rotate, but right now that's our that's our assignment. Board of directors. The alternates. A lot of our committees have alternates, and you, you'll see that pattern as we keep on going through it. Uh, the, there's five regional associations of commissioners. There's the North, Coastal, Sacramento Valley, San Joaquin Valley, and the South. If you go to CACASA's website, you can see exactly which counties uh, compose one. Uh, additional to the Commissioner's uh, Association of Officers, the, the same map, you have the deputy groups, pesticide deputies, weights and measures, and the agricultural programs or plant health pest prevention. You have the two or three different deputy groups that are layered in the same There's a relationship between the deputy groups and the commissioners group regional uh, relationship. Uh, part, of, part of the elements that are important to know as you're getting ready for your exam is understanding in understanding is what are the standing committees? I think that question has come up in the past. Uh, this tells you what the, you know, you can see on here who the standing committees are and who the chairs are of each one. The other question is, what are the program committees? So here's the list of the current program committees and the different uh, regs, nursery, pesticide, uh, pesticide regular, pest prevention, pesticide regulatory affairs. Uh, something to note is when you're in a deputy group and they ask you a question where you're making that link between CACASA, between the deputies and CACASA, 
look to these committees to see where you would take your issue. If you're working in the, if you're a pesticide deputy and you're in a deputy group and something comes up where you guys think you need to bring it up to Gagaza, you would be bringing pesticide regulatory affairs committee. Uh, different issues and the different uh, standing committees. There's a lot of special assignments Where Kakasa does as a group, they they do a lot. Definitely take the time to review that. Review, become familiar with the different committees, standing committees, the the different makeup of each of the committees. I'm gonna share a little bit here. It's the actual Kakasa website. In with the topic of CACASA. If you have, if you have, even if you're not a commissioner, you actually can get a username and password and you should be able to navigate this website. It has a lot of information. The different, the five area groups, you can see them here. Which county you belong to, or if you were answering a question that had to do with the regional issue, you can see which of the under the makeup of the and there's also a lot of information on each of the committees. There's a lot of archives of, for each of the, the committees in here. If you haven't been here, I think you guys should uh, take a trip to Kakasa. <laughs> I put in the chat the mandates for the sealer when Angela was speaking. I know that's come up in the past as a question. I don't know who, but they put they took the time to put in uh, cut and paste all the different mandates for the sealer. And actually, what I would do is we'll go ahead and put those also in there. Yeah, if you guys have any questions on it, uh, myself, well, I'm the newest, one of the newest committee, Ruben and Ed are also available. We can definitely answer those. I'm going to give you an idea of the officers of CACASA, their titles, the different committees, uh, the functions. You can see that in the bylaws. Um, items get placed into the agendas. I give you a hint if there's, if you're in a deputy group, you move it to the different to the different committee or to your commissioner and they'll bring it up. Definitely be part of an answer in any oral. Uh, over that program committees, uh, the MOUs, all the resources are there. Uh, very handy. There's a lot to read. I, I don't think this is meant for anybody to memorize it overnight. Uh, it's it's on layering that information. I think usually that that would be the best way to become proficient. You guys seen the PowerPoint there? I don't have it. I'm going to transition a little bit to talk about CDFA. Uh, just Google it, CDFA or chart, you're going to be able to see what the organizational structure is of CDFA. All the resources are available. If you go to CDFA's website, and if you wanted to know what the different programs are, just click there and it'll give you the list. If you want to know more details and you should be able to speak a list. Of and it gives you a really nice summary. Of course, there's a lot more information as you keep on the hyperlinks, but you should be familiar with the, with the decisions and the special programs within CDFA. I think something very important is to know that the relationship between those programs and the county agriculture 
there are many times those are the questions. Another relationship, which programs are exclusively operated by CDFA, which programs are operated in relationship with CDFA in the state? I think it would be very good also to know which programs have funding. Uh, if you look at the list of mandates, you know the mandates for the agricultural commissioner, but that doesn't mean that we have a contract for each one of those mandates or, the, or a different level of oversight from CDFA, from the different branches. Uh, so knowing that is very, very important. Definitely one of the things that I've noticed or that I've heard a lot is the and that is having a hard time just explaining the actual programs that your county operates. Look at your budget documents, look, become familiar with your own county and look at all the programs. I think you should know more than those. I don't have a dog team, but I should be familiar with the dog team program. You should too if you're going to go for an exam because all those are elements that contribute towards the agricultural commissioner system. But you can definitely start in your own county, be able to explain but pest eradication, pesticides, direct marketing. Also, what is the relationship? There are pro agricultural programs that are done by the state. And then, like I said, there's some both and some that are operated at the local level only by the County Agricultural Commission. Just for removing a commissioner, a sealer, or an inspector, I'm going to go ahead and jump again. Again, the information is readily available. Within the local administration in the Food and Ag Code, you're going to find the code sections in there. The local administration is going to have. Okay. We're doing on time, Ed. Uh, you're doing you're doing fine, Jose. All right. We still have about uh, 10, 10, 15 minutes. We will we will be able to extend longer than the two o'clock uh, deadline if uh, people want to stick around for questions and answers. You can see I'm sharing the browser here. I just went to led, uh, legislative information, California law, selected for the NAG code, and in here you're going to see the NAG code. There's the local administration section. Uh, I think this is a set of codes. Division two is very important when you're preparing for your exam to become familiar. They're not hard codes to read, but uh, that may be the question. What is the process to remove a commissioner? Uh, here it is. It's, and scroll up right now because there is no scrolling. That is the process. Uh, the, but there is a formal process. Commissioners, in, there's a, a IO board that needs to be organized, a commissioner can be removed for neglect of duty, incompetence, or misconduct. That you didn't do something a board of supervisors wanted you to do, and if it doesn't fit there, then job and take an enforcement action against somebody who's a big supporter of a political or an appointed official in the county. That's not a that's not a reason to remove a commissioner from it's there, it's available for everyone. Division two, give it a read. Like I said, work code sections, not nothing, too much legal wording in there. Oh, as we were saying, um, relationship process, which divisions and programs are administered by um, administrators, several penalties. Going back to the laws and regulations, every single program where you have authority to take an enforcement action, it will be cited in there. In lieu of civil prosecution, the agricultural commissioner may program in division four, division six, division five of, five of the food and agriculture, and then division five. Let's go, you're going to see our authorities. Uh, alternate form of compliance of information. We can actually take a civil administrative penalty. It's very important that you are familiar with the process because this gets into the 14th Amendment and due process. Uh, we definitely do not want to violate the constitutional. 
highly recommend if you have access to a uh, one of the training binders for advocates or for hearing officers, they lay out the process very nicely. It's very similar between the different programs, it's and measure civil penalty and NOPA, a direct marketing or a pesticide. There is differences on the number of days, the fine amount, the classification of the violation, but due process has the three main elements. The person needs to know uh, they need to have an opportunity to be heard. That's why we give them the hearing option. And they need to know what they're being cited for. That's where the code section comes in, the information, your evidence. Uh, be familiar with the administrative civil penalty. That's a, a very a very special authority we have, I think. And I think we need to be able to, we should be working hard to preserve it. We reach compliance without going to court, without criminally prosecuting everybody for smaller violations. As prevention, that's the branch. Know the structure of the branches, the different programs. Know the funding sources, what's coming through Farm Bill, what's coming through industry fees. and how they're distributed for each of the programs. Yeah, uh, PHPPS work with the USDA. What's the role? Does the county fit in? What are the relationships? Uh, in response to new pest detections, so you get the call from, or well, you get the, <laughs> the confirmation from the, I already know before the fruit fly goes out there or a pest gets found. Uh, what is the role? Who's going to do the delimitation? Who's going to do the what are the responsibilities? There is an MOU that tells you what the responsibilities of the committee, EFA on each of the quarantine. Detections, I would highly advise you to read the detection manual. It tells you in there who's gonna do what and what the purpose is, so very, very straightforward. Uh, what are the components of California pest prevention? The way I explain that to people are that there are four pillars pest exclusion, and we know what the exclusion programs are, high risk dog team, we want to keep a pest out. Pest detection, if something gets through, we want to be able to find it. You have to detect it, so we have our pest detection programs. When we find them, we try to eradicate them. And if that's not feasible, then you do pest management. Each of the quarantines are, or which of the pest programs are in that state. the system works and which programs we may call them different but that's the overarching programs for pest prevention programs glassy wing i think that's a very important one a billion dollar industry in california it's just wine it's table grapes and it's many other crops very important it's funded, you know, that has a very interesting funding source where for the protection of the industry. ACP the same way with the citrus industry. Uh, and we gotta be ready to respond and manage those pests as best as possible to protect the industry and our local environment. And services, uh, this is another branch within um, standardization, organic, eggs, consumer, service, consumer protection programs. What is the structure? What are the programs, the different in the branches? What are the funding sources? Farmers markets, organics, that they, they all have in, in, in discrete funding sources. Yes, work in USA and county is wrong. And I may need your help with that one. Role in inspection services. Did you ask me a question, Jose? The USDA role in, in, in the inspection services. Oh, I'm assuming that probably is what our FIDO program. Oh, yes, yes, good, thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, again, direct marketing, be familiar with the program, understand why the, what are the exemptions to standardization under the direct marketing from the producer to the consumer versus going through the channels of trade or the, the commercial? 
program. Um, 15, another important one. Turn it over to Ed here. Ed, are you in this one? Yeah, I'll, I'll take on, I'll, I'll go from here. Thank you, Jose. I really you. appreciate your covering those for us. Uh, one other thing that the USDA does is they establish uh, standards for produce. And some of those standards are adopted into the California uh, regulations uh, for us to enforce here in California. So those are US standards and uh, <clears throat> shipping point inspection does a lot of uh, certification based on those US standards. And they may not necessarily directly correlate to uh, the California minimum standards. Uh, so, so we kind of have a little bit of a different layer uh, sometimes that's, that's uh, may actually conflict from time to time with the US standards. Um, so there's, there is kind of a, a little bit of a role with that. The uh, USDA also uh, oversees the, the uh, national organic program, which oversees the state organic programs uh, in California as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. Uh, hopefully this works. Can everyone see that all right? And I'll catch up to where we just left off. So um, some of the more important things I think uh, that everyone needs to really understand, um, and, and I don't wanna belabor this slide too much, but uh, just what are the relationships and the responsibilities at each level? Um, what, are the, what are the different levels of government and what are the different um, branches of government? Um, so what does the balance of power mean? So we have basically in the United States, three levels of government. We have the federal government, we have the state government, we have the, the local government, uh, whether that's a city or a county level. Most of the agriculture uh, programs uh, relate, especially in California, and California is unique in the United States, that we have the agricultural commissioners system. Uh, most other states, uh, basically do most of their regulation of, of business and commerce and agriculture at the state level. So uh, California, uh, we, we pass that down one level to the counties and it's, it's more uh, direct relation to the, the people in the community uh, regulation done at the, at the local level. So uh, balance of power is the balance of power between the the legislative branch who uh, establishes the laws, the executive branch who carries out those laws, and the jurisdictional or the, the, the courts uh, that actually interpret those laws uh, to make sure that they're being uh, carried out uh, properly. So that's kind of the balance of, of powers uh, in the United States, and that goes all the way down to the local level as well. Um, I, don't, I wouldn't dwell too much on government officials, but uh, being accountable, but um, actually, I guess we should, shouldn't we? <laughs> but uh, we are accountable to the public, number one. We're, we're individually accountable to our CEOs and to our boards of supervisors. Uh, and in addition, the agricultural commissioner has a whole bunch of bosses um, and that includes the state programs as well that have some oversight responsibility and uh, for direction and, and uniformity of, of helping us to stay consistent in the way we enforce laws and regulations. Jose touched on due process and did a great job of explaining that uh, we don't wanna take any action um, to take away a privilege or a right a property of any individuals without due process of law. And that means they need to have a notice of, of what you're intending to do in government uh, that might impact their lives <laughs> in some way and that they have an opportunity to ask for a hearing uh, to, to respond to whatever in, uh, you tell them you're intending to do. That applies to not only the 
the NOPA process or the administrative civil penalty process, process but it, it applies to the establishment of laws and regulations as well. And so the way that due process is given in California and, and anywhere in the United States is if a legislative body determines that they want to establish a, a rule or a law that may impact my life, my liberty, or my property, uh, I, have, I have a right to due process, which means they have to tell me what they're gonna do uh, in advance. They have to provide a public hearing or an opportunity for a hearing. Uh, give me an opportunity to provide my comments or my uh, reaction to that, uh, that action that they plan to do. And then they have to give me a, a clearly written uh, decision uh, explaining why they chose to, to uh, make the ruling that they did and any changes that are in that process. So that works with both the legislative process it works with the regulation, the development of regulations. It works with the administration of justice through the NOPA process, the administrative civil penalties, all of those things. It's, it's kind of basically the same type of measures that have to be uh, taken in order to be legally uh, a legal action uh, by the government in, in, our, in our society. Um, so what is the difference between a law and a regulation? Uh, everyone needs to know this, needs to be familiar with this, needs to be able to explain the difference. A law is established through the legislative process. Whoever in whatever level of government has, the, has been elected to the position of establishing laws, that's the legislative body. That could be the US Congress, it could be the state uh, assembly and Senate, or it could be your local board of supervisors. They are the legislative branch in your, in your county. They establish the laws. And, and so that is the, uh, they're the ones that actually establish the, the laws. So county ordinances are laws, okay? Now, department heads, the, the, legislat the legislature in, at each of these levels can delegate authority to different departments and the, the, usually the head of each of those departments to establish regulations um, to help clarify or to um, implement or to um, make specific the laws that the legislature has passed. And so that's what the regulatory system or process is about is that the Secretary of Agriculture, for instance, can decide that they want to establish a, a law um, or a regulation, excuse me, I need to be careful with my terms, but a regulation dealing with the Asian citrus psyllid quarantine. So in order for them to establish quarantine boundaries, that would be a regulation. It has to be done through a similar process there has to be a public notice. There has to be an opportunity for people to respond and provide public comments. And then there has to be a written decision as to how they, what they base their decision for establishing the specific language um, that is adopted as the regulation. The regulation has the same force and authority as a law or a statute, okay? And it is illegal to, it's in California, in our system, uh, at least for agriculture, any violation of the Food and Agriculture Code or the regulations that are established under the authority of that Food and Ag Code is a misdemeanor, okay? Unless it's otherwise specified. And there are certain divisions like Division 17, the produce standards for in general are, are infractions instead of misdemeanors. Same thing with the business and professions code. Um, you know, there's different levels of penalty that have been established based on the law that is established. And that's spelled out when they uh, establish those laws or those regulations. Okay, so does everyone understand that? Okay, 
And then the, the legislature has a certain process. Um, you know, initially, usually in February, the a law is introduced. It has to be sponsored by a legislator. Legislator introduces it, the, uh, what is it? The Office of, oh, come on. The, the legal guys, the attorneys in the in the legislature, they review it, make sure that it's constitutionally allowed uh, for them to do. And I, I'm blanking on offices of administrative law. law. OAL. Uh, in the legislature, in the legislature, I think I think it's a different. Uh, anyway, I'll 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 uh, look it up and try to put it in the chat before we're done, but. Uh, OEL is the is the the branch or the division at the state government that's responsible for reviewing regulations, um, and so they are the ones that actually check the legal legality and and make sure that that's done uh, properly. Properly, excuse me. Um, and so um, now I'm now I'm now I'm. Uh, <laughs> Still thinking about the, the other question, but um, so anyway, in for legislation, then once it's approved as as legally possible to pass the language, it goes. It's assigned uh, to a committee for that committee to hold hearings and to do a review and make sure that it's uh, something that the public wants. Uh, and then it has to pass through that committee. It could go through two to three different committees. It then goes back to the, the uh, full body, either the House or the uh, Senate, and they will either approve it or, or vote it down. Sometimes they just let it die. Uh, if no action is taken on it, then, then the bill doesn't make it, it, it dies. Um, but it has to pass through the House by a certain period of time, usually, uh, is it May, mid-May or, or June, uh, usually? to get out of one house uh, in order to, to be approved in one house and, and sent over to the other house. And so then the other house uh, repeats the same process. They hold committee hearings on the smaller level. Um, and then they, uh, maybe it's the agriculture committee or maybe it's the business and professions committee or, or specific committees looking at that topic. And then it, once it passes through those committees and goes back to the full house, it has to pass that house again. If there are changes between, you know, differences between what one house approves and what another house uh, has amended that bill to be, then they'll have a conference committee where a few members of each, uh, each of the houses will get together and decide, okay, we're gonna accept this and it usually it's what the second rendition you know the second house will make a few amendments here and there nine nine times out of ten that's what the conference committee will accept uh, sometimes they have a difference of opinion and they don't do that but mostly that's the way once it passes through both houses and and possibly the conference committee it gets sent to the governor uh, and the governor has three options. He, he can either sign the bill, veto the bill, or allow it to uh, become law without a signature. Um, there's two different types of legislation. There's, there are urgency bills and there are uh, regular bills, okay? An urgency bill requires a two thirds majority vote all the way through the process. And it can be adopted immediately upon the governor's signature. It becomes effective immediately when the governor signs that, signs that document and it gets put into law by the secretary of state. Um, so, so normally in other bills that don't, don't have that urgency clause, a lot of times the urgency bills will be financial or some kind of emergency you know, proclamation or something like that. If it's not an urgency bill, it, the governor has 30 days essentially to either sign it or, or allow it to become a law or veto it. If, uh, and then after that, the bill uh, takes effect, becomes effective on January 1st of the year following that legislative action. So that's the difference between urgency and uh, regular bill. 
the regulation follows a little bit different path. The secretary of the agency will uh, draft language, will send out a public notice, ask for public comment. They give 45 days for public comment. Uh, and depending on what that comment is, comment is and whether they decide that secretary decides to make changes in the process, uh, it depends on how substantive those changes are. If it really affects um, how the bill will be implemented or the provisions of the bill, that's a substantive change. And that requires an additional 45 day uh, public comment period after the, the department reviews it and comes up with new language. So you have a 45 day period. There could be 30 days, 60 days, however long it takes the department to review and come up with new language. They send it out for another 45 day period. They look at what, what's received. They could do this two or three times, uh, potentially, if they decide to make substantive changes each time. Usually it's one, one shot at substantive changes. And then after that second time, uh, they will go ahead and, and establish the law. The Office of Administrative Law has to review any language that's proposed by any department, and they have to approve it to make sure that it's legal. Once they approve it, it then becomes, um, they send it over again to the Secretary of State's office, who actually puts it, writes it into the code. Um, and that usually takes place um, within the next quarter after the OAL approves it. Okay, so that's kind of the process how, how that's done. I need to make sure I'm keeping track of my time here. Uh, so I think we kind of covered that piece of it anyway. Um, another item that has been a common test question in the past, and I'm not saying that this is gonna be on the exams, but it, you, you should know something about this. And, and both Ruben and I think Angela and Jose have all kind of made some comments about getting a state, you know, getting a contract through the local process. Um, so you should know how, you know, we have uh, different programs like the ACP bulk citrus program uh, that the state wants the counties to do. They ask us to develop a work plan that tells them how, how much work they're going to do that each county is going to do. Once that work plan is, is um, reviewed and approved at the state level, they'll send out a draft contract uh, to the county uh, ag commissioner. At that point, the county ag commissioner will usually take that draft contract to their county council's office to make sure that the county can live with the terms of that contract or that agreement. Um, and so that, that's the county council's review. Once that happens, then generally speaking, at least some point in the life of this contract, um, it has to be presented to uh, number one, the CEO's office. Uh, and oftentimes it'll go to the CEO before it goes to the county council, um, just so they know this is what my ag commissioner is, has up his sleeve and what he wants, us, what's, what he wants to commit our county to, to doing that kind of program. And then the CEO's office reviews, they approve, approve or don't approve. The budget office usually looks at it to make sure that it can be done within county resources. Um, if it's reasonable, if it, if it meets the standards for the county uh, controller's office or, or budget office. And then it gets presented to the board of supervisors. Once the board of supervisors approves it, Either the county CEO uh, will sign it, or they may delegate. Most time, most often, they delegate the authority to sign these agreements to the agricultural commissioner or sealer. Once that happens, the commissioner signs it, sends it back to CDFA uh, contract office. CDFA uh, signs it under the authority of the secretary of agriculture and they send it back and it becomes execute, uh, an executed contract. So that's when work can, can commence on that contract, generally speaking. 
Sometimes there's except, exceptions. Um, as long as that's approved by the board, they may, you may be able to start a program before the contract is completed, as long as your board gives you the authority to do that. Um, but that's kind of an unusual situation. Okay. Um, and by the way, um, I wanna make sure everyone knows we can stick around for a few minutes after two o'clock uh, for Thank questions you. and answers uh, that people might have uh, as, as you know, things come up, okay? So you need to kind of be aware of what kind of actions require a Board of Supervisors approval, things like county ordinances. If you have a package, uh, a package inspection ordinance uh, where you charge a, a package uh, registration fee for a company that packs more than 10,000 containers, for instance, uh, then that has to go through the board and get their approval. And that becomes a, a county ordinance. Um, so things like county ordinances, uh, the hemp ordinances, for instance, uh, that vary, anything that varies from the state law, um, we usually have to take that to the board of supervisors for their approval in order to establish a, a county ordinance, okay? And it's a similar process, you know, the county council looks at it, the controller's office looks at it, the budget office looks at it, the CEO's office looks at it, and then the board either approves or doesn't approve. Um, and then you should be familiar, and you know, I kind of went through some of that process on how things get uh, placed onto the board's agenda. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on to some of the more uh, key issues I think that everybody has to know. Um, unfunded, unrefunded gas tax or unclaimed gas tax. Um, the Food and Ag Code section 224 uh, lines out how this, how this funding is going to be distributed. Uh, and what, what the unclaimed gas tax is, is that Everybody, uh, hopefully you're well aware that you're being charged tax on every gallon of gasoline that you buy at the pump. Same thing happens for farmers. Same thing happens for landscapers. They get charged uh, 51 cents or whatever the, the current rate of, of gasoline tax is for every gallon of gas that they buy to use in their equipment. Well, the equipment that's not used on the highway is not subject to the gas tax. And so farmers can actually uh, file to, to claim their, their share of the gas tax that, uh, for the gasoline that they purchased and get, get that refunded to them. 90% um, plus of the farmers don't bother to make that claim. Um, and so there's a big pool of money sitting out there that um, is unclaimed. And so there's a formula that's developed between the Department of Transportation and the Department of Food and Agriculture. Uh, every two years, uh, they review and they've, they've established a formula that says, we know that a certain amount of gasoline is used on, on farm. And then there's a certain amount of gasoline that's used by small horticultural equipment like leaf blowers, lawnmowers, those kind of things. And so the gas tax from those gasoline sales is put into a pool that comes back to the county agricultural commissioners or actually goes to the Department of Food and Agriculture for distribution. And these items here under Food and Ag Code 224, pesticide use enforcement, uh, the the CDFA liaison, uh, Hiram, gets, gets a share of the funding. Uh, the CDFA uh, takes a share for administration or overhead. Um, there's also a portion that comes for county administrative activities. Um, detection trapping has an earmark of $3 million that goes specifically for pest detection trapping programs, uh, either to CDFA or to the counties. Um, depending on who's doing the trapping in the counties. There's an emergency fund, which I'm a committee member for, and there's $3 million there that provides kind of upfront money when there's an emergency eradication project like the Mediterranean fruit fly that just happened in 
San Bernardino, LA County uh, to try to eradicate uh, or the glassy wing sharpshooter infestation in Solano County, uh, they're trying to eradicate. A portion of that e emergency fund is allocated for that purpose. And then the, everything else falls under these other ag programs of joint responsibility. Jose showed you the food and ag code section that talks about local, local authority or local enforcement. One of those sections says that for programs that the legislature has determined that both the state and the county have a role in enforcing, the county shall, shall be the boots on the ground at the local level, and the state shall have oversight and uniformity direction for those programs. Um, and so those are the programs of joint responsibility. We're state and counties are both responsible for carrying these programs out. And so anything that's under the supervision of the secretary that fits under those categories is, is eligible for reimbursement the year after the actual expenditure is made um, from the money that the county pays into those programs. So high risk, we have a contract for, right? A lot of counties spend a lot more money than what the state pays for under the high risk contract and whatever whatever county money that goes into that particular program, a portion of that is reimbursed through the unclaimed gas tax the following year after the expenditure is made. Okay. Um, now, in order for counties to be eligible to get some of that money that unclaimed gas tax for programs of joint responsibility. They have to maintain uh, a commissioner. They have to, to make sure they contract with a commissioner. They have to submit annual time, timely financial statements and they have to maintain a certain level of county funding in their programs, which is a rolling five-year average. So, so county, county funding has to stay at a certain level in order to be eligible for that unclaimed gas tax. It's a very, very significant portion of county ag commissioners funding. The gas tax is, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the current um, general distribution under that other ag programs, but I think it's in the $70 million range on the state level right now. And it changes a little bit from year to year, depending on how much gasoline is consumed in the state. Um, let's see. So anyway, um, if the county is not able to justify, uh, you know, if they can't maintain that level of funding at the county level, um, they have to justify why they weren't able to maintain that level. And CACASA has a committee that reviews that um, and the Secretary of Agriculture uh, takes the CACASA committee's recommendation, usually, and determines whether or not uh, the county that fails to meet their maintenance of effort is going to receive their share of the gas tax. The Secretary in, in recent years has actually taken kind of a penalty approach of ten, taking 10% of that funding away from a county or two. In the past, it's been the full, the full allotment of unclaimed gas tax that some counties have actually lost. Um, very rare, uh, but occasionally uh, that does happen. Usually if a county has a hardship that they can demonstrate this year, for instance, we're all having a hard time hiring people. We're all having a hard time finding people. People are changing jobs like they're changing their t-shirts. Um, you know, right now. So there's a big, big turnover in uh, staffing and it may be hard to, to keep that level of funding or that level of expenditure going if you don't, if you aren't able to keep the positions filled. So that may be a hardship that you could explain as the reason why you, you weren't able to maintain your level of funding for the five-year average. So, but the whole design of this is to keep agricultural programs for being unduly cut when 
there's, you know, the sheriff has a brand new shiny helicopter and a brand new shiny uh, uh, operations trailer that, that he decides that he was going to buy and the county says, okay, we'll spend the money on that. Ag, sorry, but you're not getting, you're not getting your share. The, the object is to make sure that there's a, a fair distribution of, of county funding uh, maintained in the county. So, okay, uh, let's go ahead and move on. The annual financial statement, again, as I said, um, essentially is required as part of the distribution of the gas tax. And it's simply a report of all the county agricultural commissioners activities uh, for all of our programs. Some counties have animal control. We, we all now have uh, weights and measures. Those items aren't in the food and ag code as a program of joint responsibility. Um, roadside weed abatement for fire control is not one of those eligible programs, even though weed abatement for invasive pests is, okay? So on our annual financial statement, we have this thing called above the line, which are all of those programs of joint responsibility and below the line, which are all those programs where, uh, where the secretary does not supervise the commissioner uh, in an agricultural program, okay? And only those programs above the line are eligible for a share of the unclaimed gas tax, okay? Uh, this form is due to the secretary on October 31st, although sometimes it's hard for counties to get that done. We've had some issues with that in the past. And it, it is used to determine the share for each county of the net county expenditures. Okay. Um, let's see. That's it. That's all I have. Um, wow. I'm only three minutes late. <laughs> uh, so, so at this point, uh, can you please, if anyone does have a question, please go ahead and raise your hand in on the uh, bar. Um, and we will go ahead, uh, see if I can stop sharing my screen here. Everything's jumping around on me. Okay. Am I still, I'm not sharing my screen, am I? Not Ed. Okay. All right. So if anyone has a question, please go ahead and raise your hand. I see Matt Maiden uh, has a question. And. Um, Hi, good afternoon. It's Stephanie and Matt. And we also have Sam here. We're uh, listening in. Thank you very much for the opportunity for speaking to us today and helping us prepare for our exams. The question I had was um, something about the CDFA monthly summaries that we have to submit um, as part of our work plans. Um, I'm just wondering how is that used by CDFA um, and to make decisions for the programs or is it part of the consideration when looking at the um, unclaimed gas tax or what, what are those, um, what are they used for? Thank great, you. great question. Um, some of that is a legacy uh, of history. Um, those reports are, again, under the, the uh, local, in the Food and Ag Code, those reports are required under the local enforcement administration of the Food and Ag Code. So it says that the county ag commissioner shall report their activities uh, to the Secretary of Agriculture. And so Technically, those are required. Some of the state programs still utilize those, those reports. Uh, some of the state programs no longer use them. Um, and technically, the counties are still sp supposed to be submitting those reports legally. Um, but, but if the state program is not using them to help manage their program and determine what the priorities for the program are and those kind of things, it's, um, it's not really a, a help. But for the most part, those forms are used to um, build the annual financial statement. Uh, the activities that go into 
uh, each of those areas, each of those different report forms um, is, is then translated to the annual financial statement as part of our gas tax distribution. So that would be, I, I think, my, my response on that. Uh, Stephanie? Yeah, just a clarification. So that last part you were mentioning, so you're saying some counties use those reports, monthly reports as part of uh, gathering their information for the AFS? There, that's, what, that, what, that's what they were originally intended for, yes. Okay. I understand. Those are the programs that are under joint responsibility with the secretary. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? There's a question in the chat. I can read it to you. Right, Thank so you. Go into DMS marketplace surveys and more specifically, how a deputy can use the information to improve the program. Angela? Where's my remote? Hold on. Could you repeat the question? Sure. Could you go into DMS marketplace surveys and more specifically how a deputy can use that information to improve the program? I think you can you can direct your your resources based on what you're finding. Um, if they, there's a problem in usually they'll pick a commodity type, meat or poultry or I mean I'm sorry meat or produce or baked goods. You can take those results and, and kind of also, you know, when time allows, focus, focus on those inspections and help clean up that problem. That, because um, to me, that's really telling the standing in the marketplace and also where we, you can see that maybe it's, well, I hate to say the word chicken, but maybe the poultry part of the survey is what, or where the problem is. You can use it to direct your resources. Anybody else want to add anything to that? Okay, yeah, mainly I would just say it's, it just helps you focus where there's more non-compliance and where resources are needed to be directed. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good snapshot too, I guess, of the condition of the industry at the time as well. It just tells you, and, and like you said, Angela, it helps you to focus on what, what needs work and where it needs work. Um, there's another uh, question uh in the in the uh chat from dan about the gas tax um uh, why it's not feasible to prove that they meet the refund requirements uh, a lot of people as i understand are concerned that if they claim too many exemptions that that's a red flag for audit and so a lot of a lot of growers uh tend to kind of shy away from that a little bit. And in the past, that's been part of the part of the issue. And I think truly a lot of them don't really even know that it's available. Um, that, so they don't they don't bother to to ask for that um, ask for that money back. But um, those are the things I've heard in in the past about the gas tax. My light keeps going off on me here. Um, okay. Uh, other questions? Oh yeah, uh, Nina, Nina uh, Zlatkov uh, actually asked if it was the legislative council that I was having a hard time coming up with, and yes, that's the that is who it is. Thank you, Nina. They approved the legislative language. Okay. Other questions. Going once. Going twice. Looks like Matt has There's a question. <laughs> yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Ed. Um, so just want to clarify one thing. So the $9 million that DPR gets from UGT. Yes. Um, how, I just want to make sure, are they distributing that the same way um, that CFA distributes it to the counties based on your county's net expenditures in proportion to the total of all counties, or is there a different method? 
that's the way I understand it's it it is deliver, uh, distributed, Matt. It's specific to all uh, pesticide activities that are not reimbursed by the mill tax. So whatever counties spend uh, over and above what they get reimbursed for the mill tax, they get a share of that nine million dollars um, as as a reimbursement. So that's the way it's done. Okay, can I ask one more question? Yep. Thank you. Um, actually, two. Real, so the first one's real quick. Uh, 224D, uh, is that the same as um, commissioner salaries, the 6,600 that most counties get? That uh, uh, specifically, I, I'm not sure. Um, I don't believe that is. Um, Ruben, are, <laughs> you're 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 a good gas tax guru too. Um, oh, that's think, Louis. That's Louis. Yeah, I know the two two four D. I believe what that is is um, when when the gas tax was significantly increased in the mid two thousands, like two thousand five, two thousand seven. There was a big jump, is and that's when they added the small horticultural engines. Um, the, the fuel that's being used in those areas. And so there was a huge jump. And so that section went into the, the law at that time. And so uh, like, I think I'm, I'm grasping at numbers out of the air uh, from history and my brain's not as strong as it used to be, but uh, it used to be, I believe 7% of that increased amount over that year was put into a pool for uh, professional development or um, uh, for agricultural commissioners and their staff. For the most part, that pool went untapped. Uh, it was like three or $400,000 a year uh, initially. Uh, and so that pool kind of went untapped. And then the ag commissioners actually got together and kind of started talking about it. And I believe a portion of that funding is what funds the Kakasa executive director's office and their, and their funding. Uh, I may be off on that. Uh, it may just be completely the uh, Kakasa dues that fund the, the executive director uh, position. So I'm, I may be totally full of it, but uh, I know that that's what that, that was intended for it was to help provide extra training for staff and nobody ever tapped that funding so it, it basically if it's not used it gets redistributed to all the counties the same as the 224 g uh, section of funding just based on what every county has spent so i i probably ought to <laughs> ought to research that better matt uh, but that's my understanding of it and the last question, I just wanted to clarify this. Uh, 6393, so with the mill disbursement. So 6393, that's the big section that goes over all the percentages and the allocation. Um, but then you have that base pay, 6395. Is that base pay, that's like the minimum disbursement for the mill? Um, is that the same? It says in the code 27,600. So basically, if you're if the calculations for your county falls under that, you automatically get that twenty seven thousand um, dollars. Ruben, <laughs> and then because I'm just leading up to whatever's left over, it goes into six three nine six for your residual mill funding. Yeah, Matt, I'd have to double check the language, but I, I do know that I mean, you take San Francisco for instance, they. I think they do like one inspection a year and but they have so many hours into the program. And I think it has something to do with the expenditures into the program versus the minimum. And so I, I'd have to double check, but um, from what I understand, there's, I think at least a dozen counties that fall into that category and they don't do a whole lot of work. They do put hours into the program, but I think it has something to do with expenditures to at least meet the minimum from what I understand. Right. And then whatever, whatever's left over, um, for 6396, that just gets allocated the same as 6393. Correct. Okay. I was just trying to get, just trying to finalize the whole relationship between 6393 to 6396. 
So, because that's important for us. For and Ed, I have to head out. So, um, okay. if anybody has any questions after this, yeah, I left my yes, contact info. Feel free to call or email me. Thank you very much, Ruben. I appreciate your help today. Do you have that kind of thing? Hey, any other questions? Hey, Ed, I yeah. had a question. I think I probably just missed my best shot at an answer with Ruben leaving, but it's also on 6393. And he was talking about something about really what the levers that we can pull within the section are as far as what parts of the, the mill uh, amounts you might have control over. So your, uh, the, the hours, the expenditures, the inspections. And the way that the code is written, it says um, apportionment and then it gives a percent, but it doesn't really describe uh, how that formula might work. So for example, 3% inspections, 3%. So does that mean that if we're, let's say that our county met half of the inspections in our work plan, what is, is, is that now one and a half percent and of what is, is this measured against the entire uh, mill disbursement uh, statewide and then 3% of that goes to inspections uh, and then how is that allocated by county? And so I, I'm, I'm just also wondering, I tried to kind of tease this out myself and it doesn't appear that the, the formula is, is distributed back to the counties in any way. It's just, we receive a number, a letter from uh, DPR, this is your mill amount. So we really don't have any way to audit that back to uh, say our work plan to, to make sure that the, the things that we have direct control over uh, are happening so that we get the full amount of our mill disbursement. Yeah. Um, I don't know, Jose, do you have any insight on that maybe? Yeah, they're not going off of the percentage that you completed against your work plan. When you do your um, your primer, that's really where it's coming from. So they're looking at the total for the state and then they're breaking out by the primer, which includes your use reports, it includes the pesticides, it includes the permits, the sites, the amendments. I believe that's where they're getting other data. So as far as the, the uh, work plan itself, either you're passing or you're not, but they're not giving you a percentage because you didn't meet the numbers on your um, new evaluation. The actual distribution, I believe, is based on the numbers reported by every county on the PREMA Report 5. Oh, good. I hope that's right. <laughs> that makes sense to me. For example, work hours. So uh, there's 3% of the total mill amount, uh, mill disbursement statewide that is appropriated for the hours. And then uh, one county's hours are uh, are calculated relative to the whole and 3% uh, of the total is, is uh, distributed according to relative hours. Yeah. Is that an, what you're saying, Jose? The, yeah, that's how I understand it. I think some of the numbers are also coming for the 224A, I believe, which is the UG sites. I think those, may be, those hours and costs may be coming out of the annual financial report. The portion that includes pesticides in there I would highly encourage you to review your annual financial. You can see it in there. It follows, as, as Ed and Ruben mentioned, they follow a similar methodology. But for the 70% of the mail itself that gets distributed between those categories, that information is nowhere else but the primers themselves. Uh, so that, um, I believe that's where the state is getting them. This is why you get that email. If you haven't closed out the year, you'll get the email a couple of months after the end of the fiscal year, the calendar year to make sure you close it out so that way they can have everybody's primer. I, I put the link to the YouTube uh, video for mail. It has a really nice, I've actually, I go back to it when I have to explain it to people in downtown. I go back to that video and I pause the, the graphs. It has a really nice breakdown of the funding source, the amounts, and of course those have changed. But it tells you where the 30 and the 70 go and then what the criteria is. And you can work it backwards from the program knowing where your time is going. Uh, I mean, one of the big ones, you're not completing your use reports. Be an issue that you're not entering them because that is what they're counting as part of the one of the one of the many elements in there. Okay. Thank you, Jose. Any other questions? 
Great questions, by the way. Thank you, Matt and Stephanie and Nick. I appreciate those questions. Um, uh, Takla, did you have a question or did I see somebody else's hand up? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate all of you being on the exam, uh, the, on the review today. Good luck. Uh, this is one of the toughest processes I am aware of as far as an examination uh, for qualification. I absolutely believe in this system and this, this process. Um, more, and I, I apologize that that y'all don't pass, you know, on immediately on a first test. But this study process is what I believe builds the foundation of our entire system. For uh, the work that you put into learning these, all of this stuff, you know, there's going to be four questions on the exam. That's a pittance of the information that you guys are studying. But just know that the work that you put into Doing this studying is building a much better overall system for the agricultural commissioners. It makes the quality of what we do. Uh, I truly, absolutely believe in, in that, that that makes us, um, that, that is part of what makes us as, as great as we are uh, in the ag commissioner system. So, Sorry, I'm, I'm on my soapbox, but uh, I absolutely believe in this process. So thank you. And uh, good luck on your exams, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye now.